uh, this particular talk today for me is a kind of an important one for uh, a couple of reasons, okay? Let me, oh, I have to log on it real quick. Hold on, I forget about that. And the reason it's important is because when I, when I thought about giving a talk, this is one that really relates to many of us in this room today. Because Robert Kennedy made several trips out to California in his campaign. And he rides a train all the way from Sacramento, Merced, Stockton, through Fresno as he goes on his way to Los Angeles. Uh, and he's in the midst of an incredible, incredible campaign. It's only going to last 82 days. Uh, but he'll have a tremendous impact here in the Valley and in California. And we're going to call it the last campaign because it probably in the past 40 or 50 years, America has not seen such a campaign that he waged. And why he came to wage it and how he came to wage it and what happens to him at the end of those 82 days uh, was pretty important, okay? And so I thought it'd be a fitting talk today uh, to bring somebody uh, 40 years ago who had an incredible impact on American society. And by the way, 40 years ago, united in many ways the African American community, the Hispanic community, and predicted, really actually predicted that after 2000 the year, America would probably be ready to elect its first African American president. And he was very visionary and prophetic in that. So today I'm gonna to open up with a song that's called The Last Campaign written by John Stewart, uh, and I'm gonna do it a couple times during the course of my presentation. And so let's just kind of see if we can set the mood then, if we can, for Robert Kennedy in, in 1968. And we'll talk about 1968 as well. And since I didn't get to play at the 60s concert, so, so, so we'll do this. <laughs> You were waiting for me to do that. I know you were waiting for me to do that. It was more than in Indiana. It was more than South Dakota. It was more than Oregon. It was more than California. Truly out the rain. Truly out the sun. Truly out the leaves. Dakota. It was more than California. It was more than Oregon. It was a race against time. And it was always on our mind. And he had died on the road. Truly as the sun. Truly as the rain. Truly That is the world, the last campaign. We were tired, we were hungry, we were living in our dream. For all forgotten people you never heard and never seen. There would come a time when their lives would shine. It died on the road. It truly as the sun, truly as the rain, truly I believe that it was. Bobby Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, the last campaign in, uh, this is on, 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 quick. Hopefully it's going to go on. There we go. Exceed your vision. Bobby Kennedy did the last campaign. Um, to, to understand the dynamics of this campaign, I want to just go back for a moment, and, and I'm going to talk about it in four ways today. One had to do that Bobby Kennedy would bring a lot of hope to America. Uh, as we'll see in 1968, this is an incredibly divided year, uh, the United States. Uh, he'd be bringing a lot of dreams, dreams about those people who were forgotten. One of his campaigns would be to really try and represent the underrepresented in America. And he would be striking out new ground as he really appealed to, to the underrepresented voters, to the minorities of America. And a lot of business people didn't like that, but he felt that there was a huge block of people 
whose voice had not been heard. And so he really targeted his campaign for, for those, for those uh, uh, underrepresented minorities, particularly here in California, when he, when he supported the United Farm Workers, for example, okay? Uh, he's gonna be assassinated. Uh, his life will end tragically in, in, a, in, in, a, in a small room at the Ambassador Hotel. It's one of those, those interesting things of fate where he always sort of went to the left side of the room, but for some reason he chose to go to the right side of the room and there he'll, he'll die at the hand of an assassin or assassins because the last part of this has to do with the fact that there's considerable controversy about the shooting of, of Robert Kennedy, RFK. And, and 40 years later, uh, police uh, forensic scientists and, and people who study voices and gunshot wounds, there's been all kinds of confusion about how many times was he actually wounded, where was he wounded, and, and so today we're still trying to decide did Sirhan Sirhan actually shoot and kill Robert Kennedy? He's currently been incarcerated at Cor Corcoran Prison for you know, all these years, or was it in fact somebody else who was also in the room, one or two other people? And that's not really been resolved uh, to, to this day. So in the end, his campaign ends tragically, but again, even though it seemed like Sirhan had shot him, uh, nobody can really say for certain that that had happened, okay? So that's the issue. Well, what was America like in 1968? Uh, we've had this theme this year of, of, the, of the 60s again, and, and, and we need to emphasize that America was, was simply in many ways falling apart uh, if we look at it, if we want to look at it in that standpoint. Let me get that slide up here. Uh, the U.S. seemed to be unraveling. We had the Vietnam War. Uh, we've had the introduction of the drug culture thanks to movies like Easy Rider. We had huge movements in black power with Huey Newton and the Black Panthers and Stokely Carmichael who, who were distancing themselves considerably from white America and criticizing white America. And not only criticizing white America, but qu criticizing African Americans like Dr. King who, who, who they felt were puppets of white America in many ways. And, and so, so even within the African American community, there was a tremendous amount of anger and hostility leveled not only at, at African Americans, but at whites, and, and so everything seemed to be bubbling over. Uh, the rise of feminism was, was on, on, on the move in the 1960s, and again, uh, as women were, were now trying to secure their rights, a lot of civil unrest with riots and, and, and protests and marches uh, that seemed to be happening in every city. And, and then there was the anti-war movement that simply fractured American society, fractured families, fractured friends, uh, sent young men to Canada, uh, caused all kinds of internal problems at home, draft dodgers, et cetera. And, and so America was just, w was simply, one, we were wondering what's happening next. And, and Lyndon Johnson was the president at that time, and by all, by all means, he should have been the president who would have sought re-election. But in the streets, the, the protesters were calling him baby killer. And African Americans were moving away from supporting him. Hispanics were not paying any attention to him. His own white middle class base was becoming very frustrated with, with the war in Vietnam. We couldn't seem to be ending that war. And ultimately, because of all the pressures and everything that was happening to him, out of the, out of the blue, he decided unexpectedly, unexpectedly to not seek reelection in 1968. And so I use the, 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 the metaphor here of the, of the thunder and the lightning because that's what it really was. All of a sudden, uh, America didn't know what to do. The Democrats had no leader. There was nobody in contention for the, for the actual nomination. And so he was simply walking away. And I would liken it today by, by suggesting that if President Obama, in a couple of months, suddenly said, I'm not running for president, I've decided not to seek reelection, it would be something similar in terms of magnitude. How, how would the country face that? What would they do, okay? So he was dealing with that. So again, the U.S. seemed to be unraveling. We have all these issues. And then, and then on March 31st, Johnson announced he wouldn't seek re-election, and that simply was like a thunderstorm hitting the political arena. And at that point then, uh, Robert Kennedy had begun now, very carefully, to, to begin talking with people like Dr. King had been coming out west a couple of times, talking to, to those who were supporting Cesar Chavez. He began to be thinking, maybe I should follow in the footsteps of my brother John, who of course had been assassinated as well. And with the Kennedys, this was always on their mind as well. He, he always used to say, Robert Kennedy did, you know, I'm only, I'm only a bullet away from the White House. And again, it was pretty prophetic. And, and he did not get to the White House because of an assassin's bullet, okay? So there's just a picture of him and Dr. King. They weren't the greatest of friends, 
but they knew they needed, needed each other in terms of their political alliances. And so he began to form that with uh, Dr. King. Here are the three contenders, Hubert Humphrey, Eugene McCarthy, and Robert Kennedy. And, and they now were not friends. They had been colleagues in the Senate. Uh, they didn't like one another. They did not trust one another. And McCarthy, more or less, was the first senator, by the way, who came out openly against the war in Vietnam. He's the first senator who said, we need to withdraw the troops. We've sent too many troops into Vietnam. The numbers of young men who are dying in Vietnam is increasing. And so he gained a lot of popularity with a large base of, of Americans immediately because he took that stance. He was also a poet and a writer. We would call him somewhat of, a, of an intellectual in the Senate. He was respected, uh, but he, he took a, a leap when he said, maybe we need to start thinking about ending the war in Vietnam. Humphrey was a Johnson vice president, a very, very strong politician, knew everybody in the Senate, a very powerful senator in his own right. And, and then the third, the third candidate to be would be Robert Kennedy, again, of the Kennedy family, the Kennedy dynasty. His brother had been president. He had served as attorney general. And he had some problems because as attorney general, he actually ordered the wiretapping of Dr. King. And, and, and so he's coming into the race thinking that, that he can change America, but he's got two really important senatorial Senate rivals who are going to be opposing him. And, and, and again, America simply is adrift in many ways. Um, and then in Memphis, on April 4th, Dr. King was assassinated. And, and so again, we have another lightning bolt that strikes America. And, and not only did, in a sense now, did Lyndon Johnson step away from the leadership of the Democratic Party, but with the assassination of Dr. King, the leadership of the African-American community had a big void. You know, who could step in now and, and fill that void? Who now could step in and pick up the torch and move civil rights forward and the anti-war movement forward as Dr. King had been doing? And, and so all of a sudden, within just a month or so, we have another lightning bolt that strikes America. And in the aftermath of Dr. King's assassination, we had rioting and violence in 40, 40 major cities across America so the divide between whites and blacks seemed to get even larger or deeper uh, as, as those racial epitaphs were being thrown about one another. There seemed to be no way of bringing the country together. And, and Humphrey couldn't do it, McCarthy couldn't do it, and that's really where Robert Kennedy more or less steps up into the position and says, even though America seemed to be melting down, and it was seemingly melting down, what would it take to bring back some unity to America? What was needed? People believed there was a storm coming. People believed that, that America was now faltering. It was stumbling. And, and how could we stop the, the wild sp 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 spinning top from tumbling any further? And, and so it was on everybody's mind, everybody's mind. And so there was a storm coming. And, and then Prophets and critics were everywhere. Prophets were criticizing the country, criti criticizing our war in Vietnam, criticizing our leadership. America was adrift, and, and everybody had an answer to what was going on. Billy Jack, by the way, uh, was uh, an incredibly uh, uh, famous individual who made movies in, in the 1960s. At one point, his, his movie, Billy Jack, sold more than all the Star Wars movies put together. And, and he was very much, what we would use the word today, anti-establishment. Uh, the law could not be trusted, the government could not be trusted, big business could not be trusted. Uh, we needed somebody new on the horizon. And so all of that is swirling around the United States. Of course, some were just strumming, okay? Some were just having fun strumming their guitars and kind of letting the world go by, all right? That's me. Anyway, and, and there was a lot of music that people were singing, and so that's where Bob Dylan and all these people enter with the times are changing, and so that's a part of, of the 60s. And, and, then, and then Kennedy makes the decision to genuinely throw his hat into the ring, and he's going to declare himself to be a nominee, a candidate for the presidency of the United States. And, and immediately then, it seems like almost overnight to some extent, people are relieved. They really liked his brother, his brother John, John is no longer on the scene. Now Robert seems to be stepping forward to take the Kennedy torch and, and to bring his energy and his enthusiasm to America. So America's starting to think, maybe somebody, maybe this is the man, maybe this is the new prophet who can, in fact, lead America. And so he begins in, in 1968 with his campaign. And, and picture of Robert Kennedy, uh, always in the back of his mind, however, 
was the notion that somebody might be holding a gun. And, and he was somewhat paranoid about that based upon what had happened to his older brother, Jack, okay? There were cities and states that were part of this story. Uh, I referenced a few of them in the song, The Last Campaign. Indiana was crucial to his initial uh, campaign. Oregon, he would lose in Oregon, as a matter of fact. The voters rejected him in favor of McCarthy. Kansas was important as the Midwest. He needed South Dakota. And then he will come out to Delano when Cesar Chavez was on his hunger strike and sit down with him and help him end that hunger strike in many ways. So, so he was doing those sorts of things. He'd come to Los Angeles, that's the fateful trip to Los Angeles, but he was in Fresno and Stockton and Merced, as I said at the outset, all throughout the San Joaquin Valley. And, and we have a kind of a connection with him that other candidates didn't have. The issues, the Vietnam War, poverty, race. In 1968, 14,589 servicemen died in Vietnam. That was the highest number in the entire war. In 1968 alone, we lost nearly 15,000 servicemen and another 36,000 who were wounded. By 1968, America was, was demanding that we do something about Vietnam. And yet people were reluctant to criticize our involvement in Vietnam. Dr. King had. Um, and so at that point, Kennedy takes on that charge, and he too now will begin looking at troop involvement and talking about bringing out troops from Vietnam. And that's going to, of course, make McCarthy mad, Gene McCarthy, because he thought that was his idea. So there's a lot of things that are going on. The issue of poverty, the number of people who were unemployed, the number of people who were below the poverty line had reached an all-time high in 1968. And again, America was racially divided uh, in a way that, that had not seen perhaps since the period of Reconstruction. There, and Vietnam was a part of that, of that, of that issue. And so into this, into this mix, bringing hope, bringing a vision would be Robert Kennedy. It was more than Indiana and it was more than South Dakota. It was more than California. It was more than Oregon. It was a race against time and it was always on our minds. And what came true was that he did in fact die on the road. But that was something that he carried with him throughout that campaign. It only lasts 92 days. To win this campaign, he had to win most of middle America. He had to win Texas. He had to win California. He needed desperately to win Oregon. He would not win Oregon. He had to come back and win in the East. He had incredible odds. And what's interesting about his campaign is that as people rode this train with him, as people heard him talk, as people began listening to his vision for America, even some of his strongest opponents, those who never gave him a chance, those who were in the Humphrey camp, those who were in the McCarthy camp, started to say, maybe, maybe, maybe Robert Kennedy is the real deal. Maybe the others should step out of the race. Maybe what's more important is that what he's saying America needs to listen to. A and what he did was, he asked America, let's start confronting our issues. And here he's breaking bread with Cesar Chavez during his hunger strike in Delano. And so his questions on the campaign trail had to do with, what are we gonna do about this racial issue that we're experiencing in America? How are we gonna solve our problems of race in America? Let's have that dialogue. And you know, he went into Oakland and, and members of the African American community cussed him out and swore at him, and he stood his ground and said, that's not the answer, bullets aren't the answer. Malcolm X said that, the ballad of the bullet. He said, we need to have some dialogue. And, and within a week or two, some of those same individuals said, we're on board, we wanna support Robert Kennedy. And so he, he had that ability to do that as he entered into some, at, early on, were very, very, very conflicting places and people were really opposed to him. Do you think that the people in San Joaquin Valley appreciated him coming out here and, and, and in a sense supporting you, uh, Cesar Chavez and UFW? Certainly not our large farmers, but, but Kennedy's vision was, you know, there are people here and they've been subjected to all sorts of issues with pesticides and poor you know, laws and working conditions. Somebody has to step up and, and take the plight of the migrant worker in California and Arizona and New Mexico and address that issue. And he did. And, and because of that, he would be endeared to the Hispanic community and they would be very, very supportive of him. But somebody had to step up and take the issue on and that's what he did. He campaigned a lot from the back of a train. Uh, all over California, crossed in this train and he would a lot of stories of Robert Kennedy getting on the train and stepping into the streets. 
Now, a little caveat. Secret Service at that time did not guard presidential candidates. So when he went into the streets, or when he went into these large halls, he went in and protected, excepting for those who were around him. It will not be until his assassination and until his death that the Secret Service will then order the, uh, the protection of all, of all candidates for, for the presidency. Up until that time, they were like you and me. They stepped into the room, no protection. Somebody had a gun, that was it. And that's, of course, is what's going to happen to Robert Kennedy. We were tired, we were hungry, we were living on a dream for all forgotten people, never heard and never seen, that there would come a time for a moment, day would shine, but it died on the road. Robert Kennedy believed that everybody had an opportunity for a dream and that if only for one day, for one day, there would be an opportunity for someone to, to, to shine, to have a good day, that, that what is what America was all about. And so he would speak on that. Joined the next president, Bobby Kennedy, at a victory party. He had an incredibly tough race following his defeat in Oregon. And by the time he was defeated in Oregon in the primary and the voters picked McCarthy in, instead of him, he had, to, he had to come to California and he had to work this entire state up and down and gain support as best he could to win what was going to be an incredibly close primary. And on, on June 4th, he will do that. He will actually win the primary in California. And, and so here he enjoys victory. And, and now, with his victory in California, uh, politicians, senators and congressmen, and other public leaders and those who are going to give money took up notice and said, oh my gosh, you know, Robert Kennedy, he's really making inroads. I mean, he won in California. That was unexpected. He had just lost in Oregon. So the momentum now is shifting to the point, to the point where he's now going to start talking to McCarthy about saying, well, do you want to be Secretary of State? Do you want to be Secretary of Defense? Because he knew going into the California primary, if he could win it, he would emerge as the presidential candidate uh, later on in Chicago at, at the convention. But then again, but then again, those storm clouds come over America, and this time those storm clouds arrived over the city of Los Angeles. And after he had spoken to his supporters and he decided to, to exit the hotel, he made that fateful decision to go into a pantry that normally he would not have gone into. And, and there he would be met by an assassin or an assassin's bullet, and he would be shot in the brain, reportedly with a small 22 caliber bullet by Sirhan Sirhan, and that's where it begins to become very, very murky because in reality, after the coroner would examine him, he had bullet wounds in his back and his arms. In reality, Sirhan's gun only had eight shots, and there's a total of 19 bullets in the room where he shot, and there's a young woman, ironically her name is Sandra Serrano, our chancellor's name is Sandra Serrano, and there's a young woman who's sitting outside the, the kitchen and exit at the, at the Ambassador Hotel, and a couple of people run by and they, they're shouting, we just shot and killed Bobby Kennedy. We just shot and killed Bobby Kennedy. And they're running down the streets uh, saying that. And so, of course, there's commotion inside this pantry room where he's been shot, and they try to make him feel comfortable. Uh, they grab the Sirhan Sirhan, who is still shooting, by the way. We know he was shooting, but the question is, did he really, in fact, shoot Bobby Kennedy? Because the problem with it is, is he was in front of Bobby Kennedy, and Bobby Kennedy was shot from behind. And, and so there's this constant controversy as to where do those bullets actually come from in this particular assassination. Bobby Kennedy shot, there's a number of photos, and I don't like to show those photos, but there were a number of photos immediately on the wire services showing him lying in his pool of blood in, in the pantry floor in the Ambassador Hotel. And, and because Sirhan had a gun, all the evidence pointed immediately to him that he had been the assassin. And he was a young Palestinian, uh, his name was Sirhan Sirhan. Later on, he would claim that he had been hypnotized. He claimed that he never knew what he did. Uh, he would be summarily tried, uh, convicted, sentenced to life imprisonment, where he's been in Corcoran, Corcoran prison ever since, and, and doesn't talk to anybody. And, and recently, there have been cases trying to, to reopen his case, and it's not met with anything. What about Bobby Kennedy? 82 days of inspiration in, and inspiring America. It was an incredible campaign. When Bobby Kennedy's body was removed to New York, that was his home state, he would then be taken to Washington, D.C., where he'll rest at the, uh, at the Rotonda, and then from there he's going to be buried in Arlington National Cemetery. And the incredible thing about that train 
is that even though we've had great presidents, Lincoln, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, among others, none of the crowds that lined those, those rails ever equaled the crowds that lined Robert Kennedy's funeral train. It was 21 cars. And as that train made its way for 264 miles from, from New York to Washington, D.C., well over two million people uh, stood by the rails uh, out of respect for Robert Kennedy and for what Robert Kennedy had meant to America. And America never experienced that with such an individual who, by the way, had not been a presidential candidate. He had not gotten the candidacy. He was shot before he could be claimed to be the nominee, named the nominee. He, had a, he was a very simple man. He was a very devout Catholic. He was a very devout family man, and he wanted a very simple service. He had these premonitions, and so some of that work had been done, and he had done that. And so at Arlington, he has a very, very simple uh, service from just family members. And unlike other famous people that have huge monuments to them, just away from this cross, this is the white cross that's his grave, his, his brother John Kennedy has an incredible monument with the eternal flame and all of this famous words that he said while he was president and campaigning. And yet, when you come into Arlington National Cemetery, the single white cross that simply says Robert F. Kennedy on it uh, is a testament to, to who he was as a person in many ways. Nothing grandiose, nothing grandeur. It was just a simple, simple cross. Bobby Kennedy, the hope and the tragedy. And it was a hope and a tragedy in 1968. After his assassination, Americans realized that he had been this hope. There was somebody who had a power to heal some of our differences. And in a split second, that was taken away. The coroner, by the way, who examined his brain wound said that it was less than a centimeter. And, 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 and in other words, it was just a fraction of a hair. If the bullet had been just a fraction of a hair, hair off and gone in a different direction, he probably would have survived enough to have continued the campaign. But he didn't. And, and so it turned to be at least a fatal wound or fatal wounds. Part four, controversy. Who shot Robert Kennedy? Well, all the evidence immediately pointed to Sirhan Sirhan. Everybody thought it was him, but was it really? And the police cannot definitive, definitively say it was because the guns really didn't match all the bullets in Robert Kennedy's body. Was it something else? Was there a conspiracy? You know, immediately following his shooting and during his shooting, the LAPD destroyed something in the neighborhood of 1,600 pieces of evidence. They took out the bullet wounds from the panels, the bullet holes in the panels, and those were burned accidentally. People who were inside the pantry who had cameras, not the cell phones that we have today, but regular cameras, that film was all confiscated, confiscated, and ironically, all of that film ended up being destroyed accidentally. We know that the former president, the, the police chief, and Robert Kennedy did not get along. Robert Gates, there has been a lot of confusion about that. There's some talk that he has actually was actually escorted by a couple of people who grabbed onto him when he came into the pantry. People said they heard uh, multiple shots. The coroner, then when he did his autopsy, he said, well, there's a brain wound, but he's been shot other times. A and very quietly and very conveniently, Sirhan Sirhan was, was uh, convicted, sent off to Corcoran, all the material was put into storage, and during the past 40 years, most of it was, was lost. So it's difficult now to retry Sirhan to see if he got a, a, a fair trial, simply because the evidence has been destroyed. And, and so after 82 days, with the passing of his death, we still have uh, uh, controversy regarding that. For 82 days, Robert Kennedy waged an incredible campaign. We've never seen one like that in modern times. What did he do? He helped unify underrepresented voters. He forced Americans to confront the issues of Vietnam and poverty and race unlike any other candidate up to that time, more so than his brother John did. And perhaps in recent time, no other candidate moved the country as he did with his speeches and his, and his interaction, regardless of whether you were poor or white or Hispanic or black. He had that ability to relate to people on their level and to sit down and ask them seriously, what is it we need to do to make this a better America? And, and so it was an incredible legacy. So truly as the sun, truly as the rain, truly I believe it was the last campaign. I want to do that for you one more time. Since I did not get to do the 60s concert, I feel bad about that. However, I'm going to uh, answer questions in a few minutes. 
we're going to draw two names. I'm going to give two of my posters away, and, um, and we're going to be done with RFK. But an incredible, incredible person. So, so, since some of you doubted that I play the guitar, we'll just pick it up. Truly as the sun, truly as the rain, truly as the leaves, was the world's the last pain, we pay the world power. We were hungry, and we were living in our dreams. For all forgotten people, never heard and never seen, there will come a time. Questions? All right. If, if, if Richard is here, I'm going to ask Mr. Osborne to pull a couple of names there for me. Wow. And I'll take, uh, I don't want that you got that responsibility, and I will uh, uh, entertain questions. Go ahead. Yes, Fletcher, Mr. Bones. Yes, I do. His, his opponent would have been Richard Nixon and actually the, the disarray of the Democratic Party with Johnson not seeking to seek re-election, with Kennedy being shot, uh, it really gave the election to, to Richard Nixon. I think, I think uh, he, would have, uh, he would have debated him and the, probably the result would have been as John had debated him in 1960, he would, have, uh, he would have done quite well. All indications was that he was gaining tremendous momentum and America was beginning to believe and follow in him. So I think, you know, it's one of those if questions, Bones, but, but I think it would have been a tremendous campaign nonetheless. Good question. Somebody else? Yes? Denise. Well, the speculation is, is that the LA police was in fact involved. There's, there have been two or three books about, about it and there was a lot of animosity uh, Robert Kennedy supported people in some areas that the police were not supportive of. There were personal, in, personal rivalries between him and the police chief and other elected officials in LA. Um, you know, it's speculation, but nonetheless, there's, there's, there's some evidence to, that, that they were somehow involved, at least in the cover-up or in the treatment, you know, they mistreated the information. You know, we never have the answer, and, and I don't know if we'll ever have the answer. We're still, we're still trying to figure out why Lincoln was assassinated, right? But, but the issue for us really is that it's not as clear a picture anymore that Sirhan Sirhan was in fact the sole assassin. And that's, that's what people are, are asking. And a couple of years ago he was up for parole. He's been denied parole every year. And they've tried to reopen the case. They're now going to try to reopen the case again at the appellate level in California to get it all the way to Supreme Court. So some, some, some people believe that Sirhan Sirhan uh, might have had a part in it, but not totally. And the police was involved. Yes. Well, the total number in Vietnam was 57,496. And yes, uh, we would have, I'm, I'm Mr. Oliver Richard can answer that as well. Remember President Johnson put 500,000 soldiers in and, and both uh, Dr. King and Kennedy and in all fairness, uh, others were starting to say, take these, uh, take these young, these soldiers out of Vietnam. Uh, and we didn't. Um, again, I'm gonna remind everybody, Robert McNamara was Secretary of Defense and six years ago before he died, he wrote a book. He was the one who supported soldiers in Vietnam. And in his book, he said, we would have saved a lot more lives. Uh, he kind of made an apology to America. Uh, we, made a, we made a very bad mistake. That was, that was the end of his book. Rick, do you want to continue that question? No, I think, I think I feel about the same. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, Other questions? Yes? I think, I think so, I, you know, it, it's always difficult because both their lives were ended tragically 
And, but yes, I, I think they would have, had they lived, they would have been very much powerful forces. Um, and I think the proof of that, as I said earlier, when Dr. King was assassinated, um, there, th uh, there was a vacuum and who could, who could step in? And similarly with Robert Kennedy, once he was assassinated, who then became the voice of, of the underrepresented in many ways in America? And had they survived, I think they would have, they would have, they would have healed a lot of wounds. They were on that path. Uh, it's just that a bullet uh, took their lives. Yes. Yes. Well, there's, if, if you, you have to look at each one individually, and if we, looked at, if we looked at John Kennedy, for example, there's still a lot of controversy, uh, and we've not solved his particular assassination. What, Lee Harvey Oswald, again, was the accused, uh, but when we look at diaries and we look at old, you know, files that have been released, you know, there's, there's a question mark about him and why, why that was done. When we look at Dr. King, we know that, that then um, Hoover, who was in charge of the FBI, a, a J. Edgar Hoover, uh, kept the dossier on him, uh, you know, everything that he did, every moment of his waking life, uh, there's probably some speculation that, that they knew about that and they knew more than the public ever knew. And the same, I suspect, with Robert Kennedy. You know, we don't like to share that kind of laundry in, uh, with ourselves and with the rest of the world. We, we tend to cover it up and we do a good job. One more, yes? What do you think that uh, Cecil Chavez was in the Cincinnati while um, Kennedy and Dr. King, I mean, they, they were all held about the same influence and represented people. You mean, was Caesar wasn't assassinated? Well, you know, uh, he, fortunately for him, he wasn't. <laughs> uh, I mean, fortunately for him he, and for, for the UFW, he wasn't. Uh, I would suspect, though, that in, in, in for those who supported Caesar Chavez and, and who worked with him, I, I suspect that it was at some point on, on their minds as well, uh, that his life was, uh, was in danger at some point and probably always had been in danger. Uh, he was a leader who was going against the tide of, uh, of many Americans. And um, we tend to treat some of those people sometimes by, by simply um, assassinating them uh, for rightly, you know, and that's what we do. And, and that has happened. But no, he survived. And so he was fortunate in surviving. He didn't face an assassin's bullet. One more question. Yes. No, no, and, and, and let's, let, me, let me see if I can turn that a little bit. Remember when his brother John ran, everybody needs to remember this, that one of the criticisms that came out against John Kennedy was that he was in fact a Catholic. Uh, for those who are, who are Mormon, uh, the presidential candidate, if Mitt Romney decides to run, there's a number of articles about, about his faith somehow interfering you know, with his nomination. John Kennedy had to deal with that issue first, and John Kennedy spoke, by the way, with, to a lot of college crowds and, and that question was asked of him in college crowds. College students said to John Kennedy, hey, by the way, you're Catholic. Are you going to be listening to the voters or, or the Pope? And at some point, John Kennedy said to most of America, you know what? I'm Catholic. That's my faith. But others are Lutheran. Others are Protestant. Others are Baptist. And, and I'm no different. I, I have my faith. And that influence wouldn't be there. So in many ways, he broke the ground. He broke the ground for people like Robert Kennedy, whose, whose, whose Catholicism by 1968 was accepted. It didn't make a difference in the campaign whether he was accepted or not. It did for his brother John big time, but not, not when he decided to run. It didn't make a difference. And America has to get over that too. We've not had a Jewish president. And so, so I mean, again, if faith becomes an issue, then you have to look at is, is the faith the determinant why you're not voting or is it what that individual stands for? And John Kennedy met that issue head on. <laughs>